there and welcome to the Read Local Show presented by Lit Carnival and me, your toast, your host, Toy Thomas, um, author, blogger, and reading advocate. I'm so excited to share today's guest with you. Nicholas Larum writes richly textured epic thrillers and simply profound practical theology. Let's meet him. How are you doing? Hey, hi, Toy. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I'm very excited about this interview because I've not um, interviewed anyone who writes like thrillers, but also has like a theology like part of their writing. So I'm, I'm really interested to see where this is going to go. Okay. But why don't you start out just by kind of telling our viewers a little bit about yourself? All right. Well, I am a, I'm a father and a husband, obviously. And so my wife and I have raised seven children. They're all grown. I also am a uh, bivocational pastor. So I've been a bivocational pastor going close to 40 years now. Okay. So the the writing on the the practical theology side is an outgrowth of of the ministry and things that that I have taught in in my church that have blessed people. And the thriller side is I I just like thrillers. Nice. <laughs> And so the mashup is what happens to characters in that kind of a world, because that kind of a world exists. Real spy worlds exist yeah. and real dangers in the world exist. And there are people who don't know God and there are people who come to know God. And then there are people who do know God. So what happens to a person in that circumstance? What kind of dynamics happens to that individual? And and how do you tell a story like that? So when the concept first came to me many, many, many years ago, those were the ideas I was toying with. Yeah. Uh, as a, for instance, you know, what happens if Jason Bourne is in the middle of an op and someone witnesses to him on the street about Jesus and he gets born again, but he still has to save the world by killing the baddies. What happens? <laughs> That is, oh my goodness, that is, I didn't even think about it like that, but I don't guess we definitely are going to talk about that some more. Okay. <laughs> so before I, I move on into our first segment, we're still in a, a little intro part here because I understand that you have quite an extensive background in either attending or being part of at least a programming guest at maybe some cons or some book fairs. Um, why don't you just share a little bit about that experience? Okay, so uh, when I when I first published Gypsy Spy in, in 2016, the local libraries and, and the local writing community highly supportive of independent authors, yeah. which is really exciting. And so my first entry was into a, an indie author day that the Central Library in Virginia Beach put on, and it was just it was really great because it, it was probably the first time I got around a whole bunch of people who were really excited, excited about writing their projects. You know, most writing's a, writing's a rather lonely art. It can be, you know, you, you do it somewhat in isolation. Right. And then to get around um, uh, a group of folks and that's, that's what they do. Of course, we're all excited about, we wouldn't be writing about it if we weren't excited about it. Right. So, yeah. That, that was the start. And there was a great time period in the local libraries and also in communities. So, uh, the Portsmouth Chamber of Commerce uh, did a lit walk during Christmas one one year, and um, they had different events. And so there were opportunities to meet people. And and uh, I think that one they had a set up on the street and they had a whole map for people to come by and go into different shops and mm -hmm. being able to share. Um, the Virginia Beach Library had four had nights where people could come in in their auditorium and they, they would set up two, three authors for a Q&A and do that sort of thing. So all that was kind of fun. And then aside from that, with uh, with some of the local uh, writing groups to be able to present to them, teach some on the craft, uh, share some with fellow authors on things like how to put together a book trailer or yeah. you know those those types of things so that's that's been my primary experience of being able to get out there and mix it up with folks aside from book, book signings 
Well, that I think that's great. I mean, I have, you know, been doing this for a while and I've talked to people all over the country and the world and not everybody has that great supportive like local community. So I do think that's one of the things that that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do a show specifically about our local area is to yeah. highlight that because I feel like that's something that we have that maybe some other people don't. Yeah, I, I just I think it's really amazing what, you know, the, you know, like, um, uh, just the things that we have in this area. I, I was going to say Mosa, but it's not Mosa. But anyhow, you have you have Hampton Roads Riders, and and yeah. uh, um, you, you have the the spot in in Norfolk where riders can go and and work and take seminars and a lot of support uh, for authors all the way around, both yeah. traditionally published and independent, which is really exciting. It's a very vibrant community. Yeah. Even even with the COVID hit, we came through. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with that. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, so that was just kind of like our little introductions. And so now we're going to get into it. The first segment I call is on the bookshelf because I feel like foremost, if you're going to be a writer at some point, you had to also be a reader. And so I'm going to ask you a couple of readerly questions. Okay. <laughs> so let's see here. Um, how many books would you say you read a year? So in years where I'm not actively writing a book, it's between 40 and 60, wow. depending on the subject matter. Right. <laughs> so if it's um, if I'm in a half and half season where I'm, I'm chewing through fiction books, both audio and, and e-books, along with regular nonfiction um it, it hovers more to the 60, but sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll hit a book. Like I, I just finished reading uh, my second, my second read through it. Michael S. Heiser's the unseen realm, uh, which is a theology book, but I, you know, I chewed through it slowly. So I, <laughs> I, I studied that book for like two months. Okay. So it, in a year like that, I might get through, you know, in a low year 30. Okay. Wow, you are quite an extensive reader. I I I average somewhere between I would say 30 and 60 to kind of depending upon what what I have going on. So, Gotta I think stay fed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I I try not to overdo it. I I have more of the mentality I I need to be enjoying it. So I need to be getting something out of it, you know. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Have you ever um, read either comic books or graphic novels? And if not, why? So comic books, I haven't actively read comic books since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it boils down to I'm I'm not very talented at reading short. And um, I, I often jest, though it's not really funny. It's it's really true. I I. I'm not talented enough to write short stories. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a separate skill. So yeah, it's just <laughs> so uh, my my wife uh, my wife's a great article reader. I mean, she just she she can get bits here there, and she just gets a great um, exposure to a lot of information. If I get interested in something, I've got to read something book length. I want something uh, thorough. So that. When you get to graphic novels and and, and to comic books, um, I, I'm I'm not a consumer. I appreciate the art and and what they're doing and the method of storytelling, but uh, when I when I read, um, I, I've just, I've just been a reader a reader reader, right, uh, my whole life. Even when even in in time periods where where uh, young males are more predisposed to comic books or, or graphic novels, things of that nature. I, I had my, I had my head a book. So. Well, okay. Hey, that's fair. I, I, I remember going through a period of time where that's kind of all I was reading for a little while, but I was leaning more towards the graphic novel end of it, where mm -hmm. you do have those visual stories that are a bit longer than say those, you know, single issue type things. Um, yeah. But I am now, I would say, in a place where I have like a healthy balance because I, I am such the kind of person who appreciates visuals a lot that yeah. I, I can get lost in a page full of words, but I can also appreciate, you know, that too. So I do a little bit of both. Yeah, I, I think the form of storytelling 
um, you know, I, I, I browse through them and, and, and what, what you can do and how you frame the story. And, and really, you know, uh, most people who are watching movies don't, don't generally recognize that what they're watching is someone taking what was the comic book because <laughs> every movie every movie gets mapped out as a storyboard. Yeah. And, <laughs> and someone, yeah. And someone turned that into full motion, but so that, that, that skill, um, not only the artistic skill, I, I just, I'm not, I don't draw well. So I'm always amazed with those who can. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I struggle sometimes with a halfway decent stick figure, but uh, <laughs> I, I think it's an amazing uh, means of, of telling a story. Cause there's, I, I mean, it's, it's a, it's trite, but it's true, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. And so you yeah. could put, you could put a lot down on a, on a panel. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. I mean, Again, it's one of those things that um, I'm glad that I kind of discovered it and it's part of my like reading repertoire now, but I I don't think it's one of those things that um, if all of the comic books went away, I would be like in a bad place as long as I still have all the rest of the books. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So my last readerly question for you, this is the new one. Okay. So um, I apologize, you're my guinea pig. I'm testing it out on you. <laughs> it's all right. So you're you're the first author that I've asked this question to. Do you read your own books? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> do you read your own books for like research or planning, or do you just oh you know what that's a pretty good book. Let me read that. <laughs> um, all of the above. Okay. In, 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 in a means so. Uh, it, you know, you're so, you're so deep in it when you're crafting it mm-hmm. and, and really having to think through the mechanisms of, of word choice. And did I get the spelling? I mean, all the technical stuff. So, you know, your, your view of what you're writing sometimes really boils down to a word by word thing and to be able to step away from it. And then come back in and just read it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you've had this experience, but I, you know, I've, I've read it and, and come, I'm going to turn this thing off, but I've come to it and, and read it and thought, who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, and, and enjoy Now, obviously, you know, that you, you get critical of yourself and, and you yeah. see things that aren't there, but um, I, I did recently uh, with Value of Wolves, which was my my latest fiction book, I, I just went ahead and and read it to read it. Uh, just last week, I I I did that. Okay. And it was it was really the first time in in the three and a half years of crafting it that I wasn't working it. You know that I was just reading it. It's a it's a done deal. So. You know, anything I caught on my Kindle or whatever, I highlighted for future reference that I might, you know, a typo here or there, you know, they're going to show up. But yeah, I, I just, I, I think, well, okay, yeah, I, I enjoy it. I mean, I, I have I have talked to authors who um, who are under contract or, or writing under assignment or um, people who want to be authors, but tell me they don't like writing. I don't get it. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, and and there's a there's any number of people who will sell you the multi million dollar dream you're going to make by being an author and 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 doing whatever. But with all that it takes to craft it and mm-hmm. all the time it takes to put into it, why not write something you love? Why not write a story you want to live in, or write about a subject you're passionate about? Yeah. And and write that and. And then that provides a lot of energy for the process. And if it's something that touched your heart enough to spill out of your mouth and, and onto your page, likelihood is it's probably going to hit somebody else's heart too. That's true. That's true. I'm, I'm so glad that that was your answer because I was afraid I would be the only one who's like, yeah, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> But no, I love that. I love the way you know, like you explained it. You know, um, I, I think I, I like you said I've had that experience where I'm like I go back and I read something and I'm like, oh, who wrote that? You know, yeah. 
So um, I'm 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 glad to hear that. I do I do think um, as writers sometimes we we are a bit critical of ourselves. It's mm-hmm. so nice to be able to go back and read something that you've written just to enjoy it because you've completed it. You know. Yeah, a- absolutely. And I I think it's kind of funny because in in the craft and writing people might look askance at that, but you know a gardener uh, who who does a really nice flower bed. I mean, yeah. what did they do that for? You know, they're going to step away and go, wow, that looks, that looks nice. Or, I they're mean, you played a nice meal. <laughs> yeah, you can enjoy it. So why not? Why not with what you're writing? Yeah, great. Awesome. All right. So we are going to shift gears now. I feel like um, I've gotten to know you as a reader and even a little bit as a writer because you related some of the things that you um, were reading to your writing, which I think that's just a natural thing to do as a, as a writer, but now I want to talk a little bit more about your writing process. So um, I, you've already let us know that you do like thrillers. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so um, this, this question is, the things that you write, are they, do you write things in the genre that you prefer to read? Or do you also write things that are maybe not your preferred genre, which I think you've kind of answered already, but we'll try to specify here is if what you are writing is just predominantly what you prefer to read, or do you also write things that are maybe not what you predominantly prefer to read? I, it, it, it winds up being what I, you know, the, the kinds of things that I like. Um, I, I write things that I find uncomfortable uh, because they're, you know, life, life gets uncomfortable. You got to deal with things, right? Mm-hmm. One of the things that I love about fiction is that you can, you can bring up pressure points, you know, life pressure points, societal pressure points in an entertainment format that allows people to begin to process the difficulty. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whether it's racial tension, whether it's um, grief, whether it's broken heartedness, you know, it, it, any of these. So in, in fiction, you can do some things that people are in there to, to be entertained. And and so in that mode, you tend to be less defensive so that you can examine certain aspects of life and, and, and begin to ponder. So I have found in relation to the question that that reviews from other readers uh, is very helpful because what they see in my writing isn't what I necessarily intentionally bake in but winds up there by manner of influence or what I read. So on, on the fiction side of the house, I, I mean, I like reading, I like reading thrillers. I, I, I'll read literature. I, I like reading science fiction, fantasy. Um, I was a huge Stephen King fan when I was, when I was young. Um, I read a lot of Stephen King and I, I still think that, that in many ways he's a brilliant author. I'm not real big on the horror genre. Right. And yet, um, elements of of horror technique show up because when you're dealing with thrillers or you're dealing with high stakes you know the world's under threat or if your main character is an assassin there's some pretty horrific things that happen yeah <laughs> so uh, it, those kinds of elements show up a recent review of of gypsy spy um the reviewer said that there was a there was a touch of fantasy in there, light enough that you could almost not notice it, but it was there. Of course, he's a fantasy fan. Right. And I thought, oh, where, where is it? And I thought, oh, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> where. <laughs> so so it uh, it shows up. Well, that, yeah, that's cool. I, I definitely feel like I'm I feel more comfortable writing things that I'm reading. Um, not not necessarily so that I can mimic those things, but if those are the things that I enjoy then I'm probably going to have a better success at writing those things. I have spoken to a handful of authors who were like, oh no, I read this and I write that and they're completely different. And I guess, you know, that works for some people, but I I do feel it's a little bit more natural when you can, you know, write something that you already have so much of a connection to because you enjoy reading it. Yeah, I I, I would tend to agree. And and on the reader expectation side, if you're writing a story in a particular genre, the reader, the reader has certain expectations for this type of story you're telling. And, and so if, if writing is serving the reader, we kind of owe it to them to not 
Um, I mean, you could you can mess with them a little bit, but you don't want to blindside them. So was, I thought I bought a thriller. What is this? <laughs> exactly. I, yeah, I've had that experience before, and I'm like, what? This yeah. isn't what I thought I was going to read. This is this is a time traveling romance. I thought this was a, you know. <laughs> exactly. So. My next question that I have for you, um, this one is a little bit more technical. Um, it, I, I have a, a question that I usually ask where I say, do you write on paper or do you, you know, use a computer? But this question isn't exactly that. So I, I know for me, I am very much into technology. And so I literally will create kind of like how you mentioned this already that like movies are like storyboards like mm -hmm. I'll create like storyboards when I'm like organizing like my thoughts if I want to move things around and so my question to you is is do you have a system whether it's analog or digital where you do a type of storyboarding in your writing yes and so on the on the nonfiction side it on the nonfiction side, it winds up more uh, more of a traditional plotted out. There's a there's an outline because the 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 body of work, you know, whether it's a uh, whether it's the subject matter is the blood of Jesus Christ or symbols used for the Holy Spirit. There there seems to there is an organized way to be able to present that material systematically or or one that seems to fit. So you got to kind of look at that and and layer it out correctly on. On the fiction side, I, I like I call it dream boarding. So I'll, I'll get a whiteboard and a whole bunch of different dry erase marker colors and and splash it out. Just kind of see who's where, what are they doing? What's the story arc? And then as I begin the writing process, I, I, I know the beats I want to hit in the chapter in terms of what the chap what's supposed to happen in the story. But it's not so highly specified that the characters lack freedom to surprise me and and do certain things that carry me in a direction that's like, whoa, what are you doing there? And, and which is kind of fun. So that that's that's kind of my process in it. So in the in the nonfiction side, I will map that out first on paper. But then I'll, I, you know, I, I go to digital rather quickly on the nonfiction side. On the fiction side, I stay real fluid until my first rewrite. So I don't go, I don't go digital until the first rewrite. Okay. Well, so this next question kind of piggybacks onto that. So I'm not going to count it as a separate question, but when you do go from, you know, analog to digital, are you using any particular software or are you just using like a word processor? I'm, I'm using uh, Microsoft Word. Okay. And, and in the, in the typing process. But then in my my organization of characters and notes, I'll I'll do that in spreadsheets. So I'll I'll use Excel, and I'll have um, and depending what's happening to your character, you know I don't know if you ever watched the movie where the guy gets the guy gets shot or someone spills something on their shirt. The next scene, the shirt's just clean <laughs> because, because somebody in props missed it, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know we don't. We don't want to be guilty of that as writers, you know, one in one scene, your character's eyes are one color and then the next one, there's something completely different or, yeah. Yeah. you know, you, you chose a character name that that could be spelled a couple of ways and, and three chapters in, you know, you forgot which way you were going. So, yeah. <laughs> so I keep I you know, of that when the first draft. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so for, for the interest of of uh, consistency, I'll I'll make lists. So as the process deepens, the the different spreadsheets, um, you know, we get all the way down to because I, I self-publish. So I, I get all the way down to when it's the publishing time, what my what my font choices are, what, you know, what, what font, what uh, what text size, uh, margins and, and all that gets layered in. So there's a there's this recipe basically of, you know, this is what's had. This is who the character is. And. And if he's if he has, uh, you know, definitive marks or uh, things of that nature, they're listed on on that character. And then, uh, you know, as the you know places, uh, if if you if I'm using uh, foreign languages, in particular my gypsy st spy stories, I'm I'm using uh, a smattering of Romani, which is uh, the gypsy language. 
Okay. So was, yeah, it's, it's the gypsy language. So uh, to 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 put it simply, and and it, it hasn't really been until recently, the 20th century, where access, because it was not a written language forever and a day, and in the 20th century, access to actual Romani grammars has become available and. And so anyhow, you're using these phrases and stuff. I keep a phrase book and, and, you know, if I have to do something crazy, like parse it out or, or do a verb conjugation in a language, I don't know <laughs> to keep it straight so that I, I have it represented as best as I can. Okay. Yeah. I, I know that I've encountered so many authors at like um, workshops and things like that, where everyone says, oh, you need to use Scrivener. I don't know if you've heard that. And yes. I've seen the software and it probably is great, but I'm one of those people that if I have a system that works for me, I'm not going to change my system. Yeah. Like if my system wasn't working, I'd be totally on board with using Scrivener, but my system works for me. So I'm not using it. <laughs> yeah. I haven't, I haven't been sold on Scrivener doing something for me that, that, that word isn't currently. Yeah. So some of these some of these things have have high end accesses that I'm not sure I need that kind of a thing and and yeah. I'm I'm much more comfortable with the tool I know yeah uh, you know so I'm with you on that so my my last question might be a little bit of a a, a treat on my part because this is supposed to be about your writing process but once I ask you'll understand okay. I want to talk about your editor in chief. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tell us about the editor in chief. <laughs> uh, so uh, my cat Lola is, uh, she's a rescue cat. So mm -hmm. I have to set the story up and I'll, and I'll do it rather quickly. But <laughs> my, my daughter was at the Virginia Beach Police Academy and, and she was in the latter stages of, of graduating out this is years ago mm -hmm. and so she, but i got this phone call from her and she was really upset she was in tears and she said please don't be mad and i'm like well what's going on i thought well you know she get hurt that she get anyhow well she brought this cat home you know it was one of those yeah get forgiveness uh instead of asking for permission kind of a thing <laughs> but she said you know i've been stressed out at the academy and i'm a cancer survivor and so I, I had been going through treatment. She said, we need a therapy kid. Well, well, that's Lola. And and even though we've had her for um, a decade, at least now, wow. I, st I, I still swear she's half feral. So, <laughs> so she's so she's a shy cat. And when everybody's gone, then she'll jump on my lap or if I'm working, she'll jump or the, the minute I get in bed to, you know maybe watch a little Netflix. She's all over my, my um, iPad and, and wanting to get up in there. Well, when I get down to work, uh, Lola's always on the paper. Of course. You know, she's got to be up on the desk. She's laying where I'm writing. And it got to be a fun thing because I, I get some shots at her. And when I was, when I was writing Valley of Wolves, um, I was using her on Instagram because she, she'd just make these funny faces that were, that look like someone saying, Hey, writer, get to writing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I love it. <laughs> no, when I saw that picture, I'm like, oh, we're definitely going to be talking about this in the end. Oh, yeah. She's, she's a trip. <laughs> All right. So that wraps up our open book segment where we, you know, learned a little bit about your writing process. And so now I want to hone in a little bit on this um, spy series that you have. Um, I think you kind of alluded to this already um, very early on where you gave us the example of like if someone had witnessed to Jason Bourne mm -hmm. I want to um kind of take that a little bit further don't don't give any spoilers no spoilers obviously there's two books in the series so I guess in in as, in as few words as possible uh -huh. tell us a little bit about the first book and how it connects to the second book without giving us too much too much what so like, the the protagonist in my stories is young. Okay. So in, in the first story, he is uh, becoming a teenager. Okay. And in the second story, he is 2021. 20, so he's, he's a, he's a very young protagonist. Mm -hmm. 
And the the first book is him dealing with the loss of his father and trying to trying to find out who it was that killed his father and in the middle of that um being embroiled in an international conspiracy so that's that's the first one and it it's a it's a spy thriller redemption novel okay so in in the in in the first novel he's he's essentially a little boy lost who gets found like and that. And then in the second story, he's 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 a young man with a family uh, and endeavoring to live a, a stable life. He's he's little boy found and gets found out. And so it's the story of what is an individual like this who's tried to pull out of the life but has to come back into it and and now has this whole new ethic. How does he operate? How does he keep his family safe? And 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 that's that's the broad story arc. Uh, Valley of Wolves is is a bit um, goes a bit deeper in that both stories deal with with uh, Romani culture, the the gypsies, mm-hmm. and so gypsies the the um, the subplot in Gypsy Spy is, in essence, a historical fiction novella okay. that that takes place during uh, during the Gypsy Holocaust, uh, which they call the Parajmos, okay. and it it involves his grandparents. So there's this whole story. So so you learn a lot about the culture and about the character in in the weaving of those stories in the in the second story. And both of them take place, but they're, they're late Cold War. So they both take place in the 1980s, okay. the prime stories. Gotcha. So, yeah, that was going to kind of, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was going to kind of lean into um, the next um, question was that I did get a sense that these were stories because of the title, basically. <laughs> I'm not a genius, but <laughs> it said Cold War is in the subtitle okay. so that they're taking place kind of during that time. And so um, I'm just wondering if maybe there was something that was happening with you during that time that you maybe you didn't realize then, but obviously when you came back to write the story later, that that had an impact on you. I mean, I know how old I was during the Cold War. I was I was like a baby, but <laughs> yeah. But I'm wondering if maybe some of the experiences that you had during you know the actual like you know height of the Cold War that later contributed to you writing this series. So one one major piece of that is that my my parents were very adventurous. So uh, when I was six years old, and I, I'll date myself, that was 1971. I'm the youngest of seven, and so the four youngest of our of us were living at home. Mom and dad sold everything, and we moved to Spain. So Spain in 1971 was still ruled by Generalissimo Francisco Franco. It was the last European, Western European fascist state dictatorship in place since 1930s. So it was it was like growing up in a time capsule. Man, I can't imagine. And so living it it just was a, a different experience. And and part of what they were after was an immersive uh, kind of experience for their children. So I went into the first grade uh, in the Spanish school system. So I was, I was in essence brought up as a Spaniard educationally, culturally, until we moved out in, in 76. But in that time, well, you know, we're still Americans. And so you have um, American service people who are coming through. And, you know, we had and still do quite a few army folks up in Germany. And, and one of the families we met um the the wife uh had grown up in east germany and she had gotten through the wire um with her mother when she was 14 so she had gotten out of east berlin um and crossed no man's land under fire at 14 and and so those kinds of stories kind of stick with you yeah and i remember um you know growing up in that era we just never we just we always hoped 
that the Iron Curtain would crack, but we we never knew if that would happen without some sort of atomic blast. And it, it was really a, a uh, to see the Berlin Wall come down, I can't put words to it, but it, it, it just was, it was just amazing. The world shifted and, and um, you know, it's like, it's like holding your breath and not knowing you were. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's that's uh that's how these landed in that time period. It's, it's uh, yeah, you know, it becomes its own time bubble. Yeah, I mean, I I like I said, seeing that title, I I just kind of felt like that was going to be a question that just kind of had to be asked um of that. Um, and then the next part that I kind of want to lean into is. You know, I, I know this as an experience from being a writer myself, you know, when you're writing, there are certain parts that are maybe harder to write than others, you know, um, some some parts that might, you know, if I have to, you know, write a scene where two people who are going to fall in love meet for the first time, that's a little cringy because you don't want it to be corny, you know, right. <laughs> <laughs> write a scene where someone dies and then I have to be able to convey that emotion, you know, so there are different types of scenes that can, you know, be difficult to write. But I want to know, is there a scene in either of the books in this series that was just like fun to write? Like you just got into it. You're like, yeah, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are, um, there, there are, there are several, you know, some of these, some of these scenes, you know how they, they happen. You're walking around and, the, and these, the, the scenes just start to meld and you're like, well, I'd like to watch that. You know, you're watching it in your head yeah. and, and I'd like someone else to watch that. So you start <laughs> writing it. So there's a there's this one scene in in uh, in Gypsy Spies. So the the character, not giving any, any major spoiler away, but what what marks the character is different is is that he he throws things. He's not your you know use a silencer or kill somebody kind of a guy. He's just been trained to 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 throw things uh, with deadly force. And so there's this one scene where a uh, a target is going through his life and the main character is just in a cafe and he's he's building a toothpick tower. And I don't know if you've ever played with toothpicks as a kid, you know, made little log cabins with toothpicks. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the part of the fun is, is this is this activity that most of us have done, taken toothpicks and made a building. And so. The target, he's all stressed out. We're in his head. He sits in the cafe and he's watching this kid build this toothpick tower. So it's a childish thing. And then the kid looks up and he realizes he's done for. This is not a childish thing. And 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 so the character just does this to the tower and 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 that the guy is done in with toothpicks. Wow. And and so that was kind of fun to write. <laughs> Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah i bet that was i because you like you say you imagine and you're like oh i want someone else to see this too like yeah yeah i just i just thought the the kind of fun tensions and then there's this um there's this scene in in valley of wolves uh that i call the box but the the main character has been he's been training for something he knows he needs to do but is his kind of side gig is a circus performer. And, mm -hmm. and so he has a, I don't know if you're familiar with bounce juggles or not. So a, 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 a bounce that? juggle is when a juggler is, you know, instead of just doing the regular juggle thing, he's, he, they're bouncing it off a wall or off the floor. And it's, it's a, it's one of, one of the art forms of juggling is a bounce juggle. Well, this, this is a highly elaborate bounce juggle that when he's done, when he's done with it, um, he and his wife have some things they got to work out because she knows something's up. Okay. <laughs> but that that scene was that was one of those scenes where like I've got to write that scene. So Ooh, I love it. <laughs> so yeah, now we've got like kind of a little sneak peek of some things to maybe look out for. In yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, since we're already just having such a good time, we're going to move into our final segment, which I call the silly section of the interview. This is called okay. Don't Judge a Book by Its Cover because you just never know what kind of answers you're going to get, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so my first question is, let's say something happens, there's like a major catastrophe or disaster or something like that, 
and you have to be um, in wherever you are, you know, when this happens, you're going to be trapped there for a while. So my question is, would you rather be trapped in a library or a bookstore? They are similar, but not the same. That's a good one. I, I'm, I'm going to have to go with the library. <laughs> okay, why library? <laughs> Because bookstores, though they have classics, um, tend to run to the recent. Mm -hmm. And libraries, uh, they have a good amount. If it's a good library, I mean, you have a good amount of the recent, but you also have a goodly amount of the past. Yeah. And boy, don't we need some of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that answer. That's a good, solid answer. <laughs> All right. This next one is a, you can only pick one. Okay. And hopefully one of these are at least appetizing for you. <laughs> Whenever I ask this question, they're like, I don't want any of those. And I'm like, man, <laughs> <laughs> but you can only pick one. Potato chip, corn chip, or pita chip. Boy, it's going to have to be potato chips, but with a caveat. <laughs> and what's the caveat? <laughs> So the caveat is, I, I mentioned I'm a cancer survivor, mm -hmm. and so um, it, anyhow, it was it was based on tongue cancer, and and because of the radiation, um, it, certain things changed in my palate. So uh, I love potato chips, but I love my memory of potato chips a lot more than I can taste them today. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, I, you know. I, Lays, you can't just have one. That does me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, I I would have probably gone for the corn chips. I don't know. Something about the crunch of them is just so satisfying to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And so to bring it on home, we're going to end it off with a top five list. Okay. And this doesn't have to be of all time. It could just be whatever top five comes into your mind right now. But what are your top five? classic films top five classic films um i have to start with lion in the winter okay and uh that's either late 60s early 70s but it's a film my father introduced me to and it um just because of the 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 edge between all the characters you know it's it's uh an English king with three sons and Catherine Hepburn's the queen. And there's just a lot of family intrigue and, and the, the dialogue is uh, outstanding. Let me see, go, go forward from that on classic films. Uh, Casablanca has to hit the list. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if tombstone hits classic yet, but. Well, I feel like, because that came out in the 80s, didn't it? Uh, yeah, it did. So if we're going to, we, we could stick, we could stick further back. So yeah, Singing I'm, in I'm, the Rain. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's definitely a good one. Singing in the Rain. Um, and then Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. <laughs> that's so I got I to gotta put those two in there. One more. Um, and and one more. I, I it just, just for scale and scope. We just got to put in the the, uh, the the Ten Commandments. Oh yeah, that that was a huge film. Yeah. I remember, I remember it used to come on. I can't remember which if it, if it was ABC or NBC, but there was one of them who would like you know, they would announce it for like a whole week, and you knew it was coming, and like you just kind of cleared your calendar. You know, you would get home from church and you'd get out the popcorn and stuff, and you would just sit down yeah. and watch it because it lasted forever. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. And, and no CGI, right? Right, all those I extras, know. All those extras were there. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, they did a. It, it. That's one of the reasons why I love classic films to be able to go back and see the things that still kind of stand up today. But not only that, is just to know that they were able to do these amazing, incredible things without all the technology that we have yeah. now. Yeah, like, it blows my mind. It's uh, I'm always impressed when I see a good classic film. Yeah, good, good filmmaking. Yes. So we have come to the end. I have had such a good time. <laughs> Thank you so much for hanging out with me today, Nicholas. Go ahead. Thanks for having me. 
Yeah. Go ahead and tell the viewers where they can find you and your work online. So you can find my uh, my fiction at gypsyspy.com. Uh, you can also find all of my books on Amazon. All you have to do is just look up my name, N-I-K-O-L-A-S-L-A-R-U-M, the Amazon, and, and it'll get you there. And then I also have another blog site uh, called The Bible Files, B-H-I-L-E-S, and it has uh, numerous uh, devotional articles in there that that uh, folks can enjoy. Wonderful. So we have come to the end, guys. Make sure you stick around for the credits because Nicholas has an amazing trailer to share with you. For my Patreon subscribers, he's got a special treat for you guys, so don't go too far. And until next time, guys, stay safe, be blessed, and have fun reading. Thank you. <laughs>